All right, hello and welcome everybody to Bethany Arts Community and the latest in our series of events with our fall multidisciplinary residency season. Uh, tonight we have a reading and artist talk with author AJ Bermudez, who we're very happy to have with us. Um, I'm Abby Lewis, and I'm the executive director of Bethany Arts Community here in Ossining, New York. Our fall multidisciplinary residency brings artists of um, uh, multiple disciplines and at different stages in their careers from all over the world for the development of new works as well as works in progress. For two weeks, these lovely artists stay here. They have a room, they have studio space, and they work in a collective environment where they can interact with their peers while pursuing their own work. The goal and what we see in action really pretty much almost every day is these artists sharing with each other their work and really having a spark of creativity and of ideas. Our residency program has been made possible with the generous support of grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Council on the Arts, and Arts Westchester, as well as the generous support of individuals like many of you watching us today. Today, as I said, I'm very happy to be able to introduce AJ. Um, I've had the opportunity to get to know AJ now for almost two weeks. And um, just, it's been an amazing pleasure. Uh, I will also say that I'm really looking forward to AJ's teaching me how to do some podcasts and some interviews in the coming days as she interviews her peers. So AJ is an award-winning writer who divides her time between LA and New York. And yes, this is the time in which we embarrass our residency artists. Yeah. Her work has been featured at the Yale Center for British Art, the LGBT Toronto Film Festival, Sundance, and in a number of literary journals, including McSweeney's, Boulevard, The Master's Review Story, Chicago Review, Fiction International, Hobart, Columbia Journal, and the list goes on. She currently serves as the artistic director of the American Playbook, and is associate editor of the Maine Review. She's a former boxer and EMT. We try to forget the boxer part because we don't want to be too afraid of her. Uh -huh. uh, not tonight, okay, good. A recipient, recipient of the Diverse Voices Award, a one-story finalist for the 2021 Adina Telv Goodman Fellowship, winner of the 2021 Page Award, and winner of the 2021 Alpine Fe Fellowship writing prize. And so with that, I welcome AJ and enjoy. Thank you so much. Um, thanks guys for coming to hang out for a little bit. Happy to see all your familiar faces. Um, and if we're live streaming, some unfamiliar faces. Um, no, I'm super, I'm super grateful to um, get to share a new piece tonight and talk about writing a little bit. Um, I hope we'll get to have a cool, fruitful discussion afterward. Um, I'm going to be sharing a new piece with you guys tonight that's like fresh. I've never read it in public before, so very exciting. I've been working on it over this past week. Um, yeah, and I think before, before we get into that, I will, I'll talk a little bit about maybe what makes me tick as a writer and uh, kind of what inspires and compels me. Um, and uh, one thing that I, I think I always um, come back to when I start embarking on a new piece at the onset is this uh, really interesting insight about art um, that comes from uh, this French surrealist poet, Pierre Reverdy, as quoted by Jean-Luc Godard. Um, and it's stayed with me through almost every piece I've written over the last few years. And the quote is, an image is not strong because it is brutal or fantastic, but because the association of, an I of ideas is distant and just. And um, I always love that notion of distant and just has always stuck with me. And in, on, the, on the occasions when someone 
pays or allows me to teach, I will often give students the exercise of like throwing a bunch of um, scraps of paper with random ideas into a fishbowl and they have to pick out two and then like create something and just like get to work. Um, but I, I do think that this idea of distant and just works not only for ideas, but also for disciplines. And one of the things that has turned me on so hard to the Bethany arts community is that this notion of cross-disciplinary arts is good for all of us, for arts, for audiences, um, for the work and the people involved in them. So, um, all of that is just crazy exciting to me and, um, I think that part of the reason that I, I chose the piece to share with you uh, that I'm going to be reading from tonight is not only that I've been working on it over the past week, but also that it, I think, incorporates this idea of, of distant and just ideas, not only thematically, but also structurally. And I think that when we talk about um, cross-disciplinary work, um, and this piece does involve different, it, it draws a little bit, like it, it plays into like visual arts a little bit, but um, I think that it's also valuable uh, to keep in mind in terms of how we create the work we create. So I wanna talk a, a little bit about an idea that I've stolen from screenwriting that influences my writing quite a bit in the literary arts, but also that is just, I think, inspiring across disciplines. Um, so, um, We've hauled up this <laughs> lovely chalkboard. Um, so <laughs> this, is, this is incredibly, incredibly simple, but it's a really core premise of um, screenwriting. And I think it plays uh, in different areas as well. You can all see how trashy my handwriting is in real time, so that's good. So. Um, in screenwriting, there's a way of dividing up your storytelling according to three acts, and it's thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and I really, I'm obsessed with this notion. I love it, it's simple, it's pure, and obviously this plays out differently across different disciplines. In screenwriting, it's a little bit strict sometimes for like traditional storytelling. In other disciplines, it can be quite nonlinear, which is certainly true of short fiction, but, um, and, and you know, poetry, creative nonfiction certainly, um, but basically the way that things get divided up is like act one is thesis, act two is antithesis, act three is synthesis. And it's, it's a fairly simple concept. Um, basically your thesis is establishing the world. This is like the status quo. This is things as they are. In your second act, some horrific or at least surprising at the very least incident happens and kicks us into the upside down world of whatever our thesis is. We experience the antithesis. This can be ego, alter ego, fortune, misfortune, you know, things going well, things going poorly, whatever it is. Um, and then in the final third act, which I think is always the hardest, um, there's this notion of synthesis, which is our protagonist or protagonists reconciling thesis and antithesis to create something that's new. Um, if not resolution, then at least toward resolution, something that is, uh, is something that is about a convergence of the thesis and antithesis world. We see this in, I think, every branch of screenwriting storytelling. It's certainly true in like, I mean, you can see it in superhero films as easy as, as easily as you can see it in like rom-coms. Like this is, you know, um, sort of the structure. And I think that um, this can be valuable not only from a storytelling standpoint, but also from a communicative standpoint when we talk about how we tell stories to one another and what they're capable of. Um, and the, the work that I am most attracted to and often try to engage with um, often focuses on characters who begin as uh, really as objects of someone else's paradigm and are working toward becoming subjects or inventors of their own or at least participants in paradigms to which they have some kind of claim. Um, so there's a kind of transition there and I, 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 guess, I, would, I guess I would characterize it as... Uh, here. We'll see how strong this chalkboard is. But. That's an S. 
Nope, sorry. That's wrong. Oh, and there's no eraser. That's okay. So that's fully 100% illegible, um, but <laughs> um, we'll say that the first act of some of these stories, stories I really love, um, are characters that start as the object of, you know, really someone else's gaze, someone else's story. Um, they become someone who has agency. Uh, and then it ends with something that's a little bit different, which is um, a kind of access to both subject and object paradigms, something that is new something that incorporates both. Um, the dumb, I guess the dumb way, I know, I'll just put it on here, but the dumb way of putting this would be like, you begin as less than, then you're greater than, than, and then maybe you end up at something that is like equal to, or like maybe like pseudo equal to, right? Like this is something that we start to like negotiate space in a different way. So to me, this gets like, this is an idea that becomes really hot thematically when we start talking about like issues like gender-based or like, you know, heteronormative histories, or when we start talking about decolonization, which is all about who owns whom in civilization, um, or even like ideas of like converging anthropological and ecological histories. Um, so anyway, all of this is like the illegible way of, of sort of talking about that, that three act sort of structure, which again is a little nonlinear. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, and, and that, that sort of, that dynamic of sort of giving and receiving um, attention or gaze or who has power. Um, I think power and privilege and place are always really interconnected. And um, I, I think it's exciting for artists to explore themes like that. I think that um, one of my favorite like little like etymological twists is that idea of media um, as also connected to medium, which of course is the same as like a shaman who mediates between, you know, divine and banal. Um, again, ideas that are that are equal and just. And I think that as artists, we have an opportunity to mediate uh, in a way. Of course, it's also the root of you know mediocre and medieval, but you know. Brushing that aside, <laughs> the, uh, uh, that that idea I think of of mediating ideas that are distant and just is really exciting to me. So anyway, I could talk about this for a long time, and you would be even more um, bored than you already are. Um, but I will I will delve into um, a little story I've been working on, if that's okay with you guys. Great, let's do it. Um, I should I should say at the onset also that um, there is language in this story. So if that impels you to lean in or get out of here, uh, no offense. I see you. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So this story is called um, <clears throat> "The Real India." <sighs> The centerpiece of Lark's studio is the Kant Bodhisattva, an eight-foot architectural marvel of sedimentary vermiculite clay sustainably retrieved from someplace in South Africa, molded in the shape of a woman bent over backward in an Urdvad Varasana pose, feet planted, vagina spread and on display, stomach arching toward buoyantly upside-down tits and a neutral, choiceless face, palms firm on the ground to stride a thicket of load-bearing hair. What do you think, Lark asks. I think it's a striking confluence of the obverse elements of female fetishization and empowerment. I want her to feel playful. Does she feel playful? She does. Really? Extremely playful. Mark hates it. Of course Mark hates it, I say. Mark's the embodiment of the white male heteronormative art complex. Lark nods. These are words she knows. He lives in fear that the Paleolithic Venus sculptures he curates will come to life in the night and strike a pose like this one. She doesn't look frightening. Frightening how? Like is her pussy the right shape? I look, really look at the docile squiggles of the labia, the pinch of the clitoral hood and the pearl of clay beneath, the elegant apologetic dot of the urethra, all probably carved by her assistant Andrew, who's here on a fragile O1B visa and say, there is no right shape. Lark nods, pleased but not sold. 
But yes, it's a beautiful pussy. She smiles. I think so too. When she begins to understand something like this, something she's made, you can't help but believe that it's your fault. You've taught her the words for this, penned index cards thick with the micro vocabularies of feminism and post-feminism and post-post-feminism. You've gently guided the pronunciation of Eurocentrism, hegemony, intersectional transmedia narrative. You've tenderly explained why transgender is apropos and tranny is verboten. Have explained why hermaphrodite is fine for bivalve mollusks and Herculean barbines circa 1856, but not for humans who contemporarily identify as intersex. Why, she has asked, why though really? because a community decides what they want to be called. She accepts this and will regurgitate it back to a curator sometime. You've prepped her for this, marked the signposts of native to indigenous to first peoples, POC to BIPOC to people of the global majority. You've explained what each letter of LGBTQIA plus and quilt bag signifies. She's exhausted by the quantity, but eager to learn, consults the cheat sheet that you've made for her. You've walked around the studio, sidestepping the massive swaths of canvas drying on the floor, admiring whatever's been pinned to the wall as a kind of low-key test, and discussed her work in terms she'll adopt and represent. The homages to Nan Golding and Laura Mulvey, the dovetailings with Namjoon Pike and Mika Rottenberg, the sentences read and reread, meticulously memorized until someone else's words sound like they've lived in her mouth for years, the sound bites that will make it seem like she's read the whole thing. It occurs to me often that I'm a traitor to the authors of books she hasn't read, the artists who couldn't afford the buy-in, the other artists whose work has nothing to do with her work, but whose catalogs are referenced in her lists of influences, to women, to PhD candidates, to people whose last name ends in easy, like mine. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, I cash the checks. And this is the thing that Lark has always understood. To be paid for something is to consent to it, to endorse it, as it were. One day, between the vat of drying resin and the overexposed photographs, Lark says, let's go to India. On its surface, this exclamation has the pastiche of a whim, but if you listen closely, you can hear the machinations. The impulse is spontaneous in the way that mid-century housewives would sometimes, suddenly, fully out of the blue, swallow dishwashing liquid instead of rosé. I have the miles, she says, enough for two seats in first. Already I can imagine the thrill and stress of it. Unfettered access to the finer things with Lark watching every selection like she's keeping score. How chic you are, how worldly you are, how alcoholic you are. How many times you've done this before, if none, a rube. If several, then why are you working for her? She enjoys introducing people to things, like how the vegan meal is unfailingly better than the chicken or steak option, even if you eat meat, because it's rarer and more intentionally prepared. But sometimes she grows weary of her calling as a missionary of prestige and simply gifts you a copy of the Tiffany Book of Table Manners because as we all know, you'll never be taken seriously if you hold your fork wrong. She likes you to wear good clothes, but she likes to come up with them. She brings you the latest issue of Vogue, asks you to circle what you're attracted to. You select safely. You are good at tests, but there's no timer set, no rubric, no rules. When she finally returns, she looks at your selections. After each, she nods or tilts her head. No, she says, more jaded than critical. Not for your shape. She listens raptly to your stories of travel, stories she's asked to hear, threshing them for points of interest, exotic kernels of potential that prove how interesting you are. Occasionally, she lights up and ends stories for you with a single, often incorrect sentence like, so you hopped the next flight and came home immediately, or but that's the brother you lost your virginity to. She takes you to a cake restaurant, exactly what it sounds like, right after she's hired you, and buys you a slice of cake. 10 feet from your table, a baby shower is in the throes of learning how to make custom cakes from a comically good-looking instructor, all elbow deep in nonpareils and piping paraphernalia and strips of festively tinted fondant. Lark, who's been laughing and waving her thin arms around and talking about the importance of eating cake, how you only live once, sets down her fork and takes your chin in her hand. Oh, she says, you've also stopped eating cake since your chin is no longer your own. You know, you can get almost anything done in LA, she says. Anything, places are good here, it's amazing. Then, because you might not have understood, laser hair removal treatment, she says. You don't brief her on your awareness of the field, your extensive history of borderline unaffordable Groupons or the realities of genetics extending through your maternal and grandmaternal lineage, presumably back to the Iron Age when this flaw presumably indicated some now defunct evolutionary advantage. You don't tell her you're doing your best and you don't cry in the cake restaurant. Thank you, you say instead. 
Every time you're dressed wrong for years, you blame the East Coast. It's a different aesthetic, you say, as though you're still getting the hang of things here in cryptic LA, as though you could afford the low-rung sample sale shift dresses and harem pants, all size zero or zero adjacent, one size fits all, all being a subgroup to which you apparently don't belong. She tells you on one occasion about her abortion, and all you can think is, that's probably for the best. Lark is insistent on the real India, not the postcard India or the Darjeeling limited India, the tourist India or Hilton India, She's been before multiple times years ago. She says her soul is there. She hopes to be buried there. You know that you will never go to, Lin to you, will, you know that you will never go to India without Lark. So you say yes. The night before our departure, I stay up till sunrise and attempt to acclimate myself to the new time zone, the exact opposite of Los Angeles, and to sleep through the flight. When I wake up in first class, Lark's fallen asleep beside me, and I take the opportunity to order a scotch. Poison, she'd say, were she awake. Although the first thing she'll do when we land is find and buy heroin. By the time she wakes up, I've had two glasses of scotch and swapped the glass out for a cup of tea. She immediately, briskly summons a flight attendant as though she's been waiting all this time and orders two flutes of champagne. Live a little, she says, handing my mug of tea to the attendant with the lithe, performative grace of a fairy godmother. When the champagne arrives, Lark studies it and then smirks like she'll allow it. Not real, she says, what's that word? Airsots, I say. That's right, airsots champagne. It's clear now with 12 collective ounces of brood or blanc de blanc or whatever bubbling before us that Lark has set me up, that whatever she says next will have the de facto portent of a toast. I've been thinking, she says, about the real reason for India. She leans in conspiratorially. It's the Kant Bodhisattva. Imagine her 60 feet tall, arched over the border between Jammu and Kashmir, half her body in one state and half in the other, her belly button skyward right at the border, body the same color as the sand. I nod and because I'm exhausted and secretly drunk and trapped on this airplane, I say, yes, of course yes, you're a genius. You get it though, right? Of course, it's the interstice of post-colonial post -colonial conflict literally embodied by the intrinsically female dichotomy of religious idolatry, the contraposed irony of deification and objectification. Lark smiles, lifts her glass. Exactly. Of course it's work, it was always going to be work. Lark's hired a driver and the moment we get in the car, you can tell it's only a matter of time before she fucks this guy. He introduces himself as Sai, a name she leans forward and asks him to sound out twice, despite its being only one syllable. Sai gratifies her request, foreplay slow, then smiles like the bushes are full of paparazzi. The way he smiles, the snug fit of his Henley, you can tell Sai understands how money works. Lark settles into the seat beside me and says, remember what I said back in LA? I do, I remember everything, although I'm not sure to what she's referring. White linen, she says. And when she looks at you, she closes her eyes, maybe imagining something else, some other you. You have white linen, right? I do. Lark leans back, briefly closing her eyes again, maybe this time in a small expression of gratitude to the universe and says, this is going to be an electric trip. Her hand is still on my knee, fingers, po fingers polished with a color that is the exact same shade as her actual nails. And she's right, I guess, I am wearing black, all black, which is not what we've discussed. And although laboriously selected and tested for chicness and comfort and some je ne sais quoi factor, that's really only ever a guess. At best, it is 100% the opposite of what we talked about. And in a way, she's extra right because I'm noticing it for the first time now too. On the half hour drive from the airport to Haveli Darampura, um, Lark leans against the window, enraptured by some frequency I can't hear. In the narrower side streets, shortcuts sigh averse with a wink, people turn and look through the untinted back windows of the car. Lark is making eye contact with as many people as she can. Her soul is here, so I guess she knows what she's doing. I feel a pang of the same schadenfreude I get sometimes in Venice, seeing the tourists lifting cameras on straps around their neck dodging skateboards, huddling over one iPhone to compare restaurant reviews, although now I'm the tourist and there's no joy, so I guess it's really just shot in sense Freud. What do you think, says Lark? Her eyes are shining, and, the, and in this moment, I wonder if I've just missed her all this time. If perhaps she was right all along, a savant for the things that are ugly and aren't, correct and incorrect, repugnant and resplendent. Maybe I read too much. Maybe I don't read the right things. Maybe, in this place, 
in the unpredictably scrawled circle of her magic, I can contort and flourish into some other thing. I'm so happy I'm here, I say. And I am. Thank you. I squeeze her hand and she squeezes back. She smiles and I feel myself breathe into a part of my chest I haven't felt in weeks. I'm exhausted, dehydrated and nauseous from the ride, but she, this, is how the sun is. When it shines, it shines hot. Through the meticulously clean glass of the backseat windows, I try to see the world as Lark does. Low-slung blocks of concrete scroll past, ribboned with uh, patches of color and signage, carts and bikes, smoke and sound, and I wonder if these are, to her, the real India. The window is cold against my forehead and my eyes keep slipping closed. Despite what looks like a cacophony of sensory detail, all I can smell is the pine of the air freshener, fake as grape candy, and the delicate bite of size aftershave. We're six minutes into the ride when Lark leans forward, touches Sai where his deltoid meets his bicep, and asks, in a way that I recognize from the Davichka concert in Las Vegas, the balcony of the box in New York, the parking lot outside the Nordic Pavilion, at the Berlin Biennale, in a manner at once sexy and inarticulate, where she can score some black tar heroin. The hotel is a masterpiece, blessed by UNESCO. And though it's been in play for two centuries, Lark still looks over her shoulder as we ascend the steps, immensely self-satisfied, as though she discovered it. See, she says. I nod, doing my best to look enchanted. Behind us, illegally parked along the too narrow street near the, near the entrance, Sai unloads our, uh, our luggage. As I turn, he winks, and it's unclear whether this gesture represents a stray bit of buckshot from his tactical flirtation or a private conspiratorial acknowledgement of our memberhood in the same servant class. A concierge and a team of receptionists, all clad in white linen with brightly colored nylon vests, are poised to greet us in the lobby. I wonder if the different vest colors denote different teams or roles, like in Kickball or an Atwood novel. Lark places her palms together and lightly bows to everyone at once. I abstain, feeling in this gesture the same discomfort I felt at the end of yoga classes in West Hollywood, amid an ocean of balayage, all blonde and blonde adjacent, pre and post blonde, women netting six figures per annum from their first divorces and more recent real estate licensures, reverently whispering namaste to one another. This, I'm quite certain, is not the real India. In any case, we've arrived. As we receive our keys, Sai confers with a bellhop, ensuring that our luggage will arrive at the rooms before we do. Lark has been rattling off the names of local specialties, none of which I'll remember. Let's have dinner on the roof, she's saying. Seven or eight. Eight is better. I nod with the tacit understanding that I'll hang back and make the reservation. Don't sleep, she advises. You'll want to. I nod at this, too. She's not wrong. This is the core principle of outwitting jet lag, although the only thing I've been able to think of since the flight is a nap. After making arrangements for dinner with a concierge, I head up to my room and lie down. The bed is a mint green queen nested beneath a scalloped interior archway, one amid, uh, amid a, strawl, a sprawling conundrum of scalloped interior archways facing a simple flat screen TV. On the balcony, two small rattan chairs overlook a spacious multi-story courtyard, the jewel of the hotel's internet presence, and flank a small outdoor table, exactly the right size for a pot of tea with two cups and saucers. The bathroom, which I've only visited to splash cold water on my face, is faux white marble with touches of brass, complementary toiletries and washcloths, all the same shade of faded persimmon. I lie on top of the duvet to avoid any imprints on my skin from the seams of the sheets, pull my hair upward from the nape of the neck to ward off the telltale flatness of the hair, indisputable evidence of napping. I close my eyes, but have, a t uh, have set a timer for 15 minutes. Lark used to model ages ago. To what degree, I'm unsure. There's been mention of a Pepsi ad, but to a sufficient extent that she knows as surely as an MD with a stethoscope clocking a heartbeat when anyone has taken a nap. It's in the eyes I've heard her say, you can tell, although I myself cannot. I don't know if it's a puffiness akin to the after effects of drinking or a hot shower, if either of these would enhance or negate the appearance of a nap, so I do nothing. My top priority is to stay awake against all odds so that I can appear to be awake. When the alarm goes off, I pull a set of white linen clothing, drawstring pants, and a tunic top from my suitcase, hang the ensemble on the rod of the shower, and turn on the water as hot as it will go to steam out the creases. This is among the few pieces of sartorial intelligence I've arrived with on my own, uninherited from Lark. Hers is the room next to mine, and when there's a knock on her door, I jolt. I relax upon hearing the door open, then the sound of chatter, Lark's laugh. In nondescript language sounds, an invitation in nondescript language sounds, a polite decline. The door, again. 
Dinner time is the equivalent of dawn in Los Angeles. Lark arrives 15 minutes past seven, relaxed and wise in a way that suggests she smoked a half gram of heroin. Everything there, uh, everywhere, there are tiny scallops in the walls, each set with a tea light. Each glints off her eyes the way that fire licks and then swells against the window of a burning building. You were gone a long time, she says. I've only been in my room timing everything out, but yes, I say, it's been a long time. I ordered the things from the menu that I think I remember her saying, but nothing is right. She presses the plump exterior of every object that arrives, pale beige nail against pale beige skin against pale beige dough, with the pad of her index finger, testing each piece, then ripping a section of food from its body and setting it aside, like she's done it a favor. You don't seem happy, she says, but I am happy and plenty happy. Not heroin happy, of course, but happy. I'm just quiet, I say, happy quiet. Lurk nods, dissecting another roll with her fingers. Tomorrow we'll find a musician, she says. We should have done it already. This impulse, something she apparently picked up on a previous excursion, is one I've been dreading. In the days leading up to the trip, she's often hailed the importance of hiring a driver, then a musician, as the only real way to travel through India. Should we ask Sai if he knows someone? Lark looks at me like I'm insane. No, she says, it's essential to get a vibe. The sun has only just set, but the sky to the west has turned a violent orange, leaking upward toward a murky swath of liatris blue, looking less like an actual sunset and more like a cocktail named after one. I photographed the light here once, she says, before your time. Leica, obviously. I blew the image up 4,000%. 4,000. 4, Huge. She bobs a dead bag of English breakfast tea into the silty, tepid water of her china cup. Artists do that now. You saw that fucking shit at Platberry last fall. I came up with that. I've seen the photographs. They're beautiful. Lark's expression stiffens like I'm not getting it, like no one is. She suddenly looks extraordinarily tired, a bit confused, like a baby that's about to cry. Nature belongs to all of us, she says, eyes glassily fixed on a sherbet-hued minaret. People think nature belongs to no one, but that's not true. It belongs to all of us. She sits back from the table. On her plate, the mauled corpse of a dosa, translucent and jettisoned like the skin of a snake, sits hollowly amid a, b a bay of decorative cilantro. In the morning, she says, apropos nothing, part promise, part threat. She tosses her cloth napkin onto the plate, and three servers appear as if by magic, clearing the table with the alacrity of mafia novitiates purging a crime scene. In the morning, the sky is turned from bruised black purple to scabbed over white gray. Lark has a headache, so we meet on her balcony for breakfast, avoiding the clattering dishes and silverware of the restaurant. So, she says, what are we going to do about this statue? Well, first thing is to find a fabricator. Lark nods. She pensively rips apart a ball of idli, sets the pieces back down on her plate, and we'll need a clay guy. Do you know anyone here? Lark smushes a wad of idli between her fingers, then brightens with what must be a wonderful idea. Let's ask Sai, she says. I'll bet Sai knows someone. Okay, I say. Sai, to my chagrin, does know someone. His clay guy, one of many stars in the constellation of Sai's Rolodex, will laugh, bewildered and overjoyed by the project. He, too, would enjoy seeing a pussy of this magnitude before recommending that the body of the Kant Bodhisattva be constructed in eight parts, two arms, two legs, the upper torso, the middle torso, the lower torso slash nethers, and the head. He will painstakingly coat the conglomerations of metal and wire crafted by the fabricator an underpaid sophomore at the Delhi School of Art, before loading and transporting all eight sections of the eponymous bodhisattva via convoy through the tortuous curves of the Himachal Pradesh to the border of Kashmir and Jammu, some middle of nowhere set of coordinates I've been tasked with identifying through a combination of Google map searches and hearsay, where we are unlikely to be disturbed by armed guards, fingers crossed, before assembling, photographing, and generally reveling in the majesty of the statue and all it exemplifies, before returning to our boutique hotel in Udhampur. But first, before any of this, we must find a musician. As we near Connaught Place, Lark lowers the backseat window of the car and props her elbows against the window frame. She leans out, eyes closed, and inhales deeply. Amid the cacophonics of the milieu, bicycles, carts, vendors, children, she perks up at some sound, an egregiously out-of-tune sitar, stabbing at a melody that sounds a bit like Over the Rainbow. She asks Sai to pull over and, sussing out the source of the sound, approaches an older gentleman who has what she'll describe as a kind face. 
From the car, I watch with Sai as Lark speaks to the man slowly and clearly, bent at the waist in the posture of a black and white film heroine. Couture clad on a visit to the orphanage, dripping with beatific elegance and the salvific promise of white picket fences, hydrangeas, suburban reincarnation. The man is dressed in white linen and loose sandals, a weathered sitar nested in his lap. He nods as Lark draws a map in the air with the full length of her arms, then smiles, creases bundling along his eyes and mouth. He does indeed have a kind face. At last, the man gets to his feet and follows Lark to the car. As we pull onto Gondago Road, heading east, Lark turns backward in her seat and places a hand on the musician's knee. Play something, Rishi, she says. Rashid dutifully plays a warbling riff, the neck of the sitar bobbing toward the roof of the car. Lark seems rapturously oblivious to the sourness of the instrument's tuning. Or perhaps this is why she chose him. Perhaps this is the real India. Sai and Lark are in their own world up front, the principal cast of a madcap road trip. Lark leans against the glass with her chin tilted in an attractive angle, a pose of extremis, lips ever so slightly parted. You can almost imagine the Pepsi dripping directly into her mouth. Sai glances her direction from time to time, aware of the bait, taking the bait. Lark and I went sailing once, with her then husband and my then girlfriend, and this is the face I remember, tilted expectantly toward the sun, Feruzzi's Madonina by way of gangbang denouement, before she leant over the helm to slap the side of the boat, a trick to attract dolphins. I was beguiled, shocked when it worked. This is how I picture her at times, flanked by dolphins, white linen on white deck, cosmically at ease with her own fortune. The clay guy, whose name is Varish, but to whom Lark will continue to refer as the clay guy, passes the test, predominantly by being nearly as charming as Sai. There's a great deal of forearm touching and laughter as they review various samples of clay. Lark believes herself to be an impeccable judge of character and of clay. She has been ripped off numerous times. They settle on a natural gray-gold variant, a terracotta hybrid, and the way the clay guy keeps referencing the spectacular beauty of the dunes of the Thar Desert, just west of majestic Rajasthan, without explicitly saying that this is where the clay has been sourced, you can tell he bought it online. Lark delicately trails her fingertips over the sample, testing the texture and color against the sun jutting through a slatted skylight. It's perfect, she says. On the drive back to the Havale Dharampura, Sai takes a shortcut through a settlement comprised of scattered brick and concrete structures, splashes of paint on the walls and laundry strung above the road. He works the horn with staccato precision, jarring cyclists and pedestrians to one side of the road or the other, while Rishi obediently continues to play. A handful of women look up from their work, hauling, washing, selling, building, cooking, hustling. One has to imagine what one of these women would do had she been born into wealth, if someone had just handed her money. It isn't until Lark turns back to look at me that I realize I've said this aloud. Do it, Lark says, perfectly calm, her expression a dare. Just hand her money. I look out the window and there are a lot of hers. Who? Does it matter? I understand that Lark's trying to make a point, but then abruptly there's a $100 bill in her hand, fished from the caviar leather Chanel coin purse she uses when she wants to appear grounded. Go ahead, she says. Pick someone. I don't touch the bill. I smile instead like she's made a cunning joke. The distribution of wealth is already a little too stochastic for my taste. She slides the bill between my fingers. Isn't it better for someone to have it? It'll mean more to her than to us. Lark asks Sai to pull over the car. Outside the window, several people have stopped to look. Rishi continues to play, his sitar, his sitar scaling an atonal crest and descending, oblivious. I'd really rather not. Okay, we'll go back to the hotel. Everyone stays poor today. Wait. I look out the window and try to choose someone. There's no telling who's better or worse off, who's the most virtuous, most generous, who has the most children, the best idea for a startup, the smallest living quarters, or the most sinister disease who's having the worst day, whose kid could write her own ticket if only the college application fees could be secured. Before clutching and pressing the door handle I, handle, I try to do the thing Lark claims to do, getting a sense for someone, scouring the features for lines that might mean benevolence or malice. I get out of the car and quietly move toward a woman in a blue sari, a skittish child curled against the slippery blue fabric at her thigh, and hand her the bill. I try to be subtle, but I'm too obvious. There's no way not to be. The entire street has turned to watch. Everyone has seen. 
It's clear now that I've coronated a target, if not of theft, then of envy. The woman's face is only partly visible, but her eyes flicker with thrill and panic, a look not unlike game being hunted. I get back in the car where Rashid's sitar has picked up pace. See, says Lark. Outside the window, other women soberly stare, unchosen. I haven't just given a person a hundred dollars. I've given hundreds of people nothing. Over the course of my tenure with Lark, I've often pretended to be her. Sometimes it's an art world Cyrano de Bergerac stunt, a phone interview or email to a dealer, a rescue attempt from her signature vacillation between flirting and bullying. Other times it's to book tickets or lodge a complaint to protect her from the anxiety of being on hold or talking to people she can't see or because I have all the num numbers memorized and she doesn't. That night, over martinis in the hotel lounge, Lark announces a new interview. I wonder whether I've invited this, her tendency to ask me something after a drink or if it's a maneuver that predates me. It's a newish art magazine, London-based, super chic aesthetics, she says. All right, I say. The interviewer, Ben, is young, self-possessed, but with a tight, nervous laugh. You can hear him shuffling hard copy notes over the speakerphone. As Lark, the directives are to be breezy, cool, smart, but not too academic. Witty, but not corny. If you don't like a question, just say something else. You're an artist, after all. The last time you did a phone interview on her behalf, she sat across the drafting desk and mouthed things, her lips wide with exaggerated shapes you couldn't possibly hope to understand as words, let alone articulable suggestions. And when you hung up, she yelled, why didn't you mention the post-anthropocene, which seems to have been the only expression from that Donna Haraway article that stuck, and you said it was because it didn't pertain to the work at hand, and just when it seemed like she was about to flip the table with eight different cyan oil paints, or fire you, or hire someone to break your kneecaps in the night, the magazine wound up gravitating toward the wrong quotes after all, printed the wrong things anyway, and basically just supremely failed to understand her work in all its complexity and contemporary relevance, and this, at least, was not your fault. Mm -hmm. This time, the questions are all softballs. I saw something on your Instagram about a secret project in Jammu and Kashmir. Can you say anything about that? <clears throat> I'll just say this. Lark loves it when you say, I'll just say this. There's no way to create art that's situated in both nature and civilization without aggressively inviting the post-anthropocene. Three questions later, when Ben expresses his gratitude and clicks off, Lark is already handing you a glass of champagne. She gives you a theatrical kiss on the forehead, leaving an imprint you'll see later, like a ghost in the mirror, a lensuolet of lipstick, the exact same color as her natural lips. Fuck Europe, she says. Those fuckers will love this. After champagne, a miniature compact appears, vintage Chinese cloisonne, with a wad of what looks like ossified gum inside. Live a little, she says. You will never try heroin outside of Lark. So you say yes. The minute it hits your lungs, you get it. You're a fan. You understand perfectly why people do heroin. The world is fists unfurled, languid with welcome. Lark is jaded, more experienced, lazy with bliss. Do you remember that night at Basel when we did Molly? After Versace. Yes, you remember. I remember, but I didn't do Molly. Yes, you did. We both did. I didn't. I drank the Blue Lagoon you ordered because you don't believe in drinking blue, which I fully respect, and then we got to the airport right before our flight. No, but you did Molly. No. Lark smiles a vicious smile, looks at you like you're lying, like you're a prude, despite the fact that you've just smoked heroin in front of her. Okay. I didn't. Okay. Lark smokes again. You take the pipe and pretend, already lush with regret. We did good tonight, she says. Yes, I say. Yes, we did. In the morning, sunlight slathers the courtyard in a slick, soberly green-white sheen. Lark is already gone, presumably off haranguing the clay guy about the shape of the clitoris. I drag myself to the balcony, wishing for death. My hair smells like black tea and vinegar, and with a crest of nausea, I am decisively disenchanted with heroin. Beyond the rollickingly hazy night of half-sleep, dreams of granular gray-gold sand in my mouth and eyelids, the feeling of apathy, but certainty that I've left the garage door open, de fact, despite the fact that I don't have a garage, and if I did, it would be 8,000 miles away and beyond the scope of the plastic thumbnail remote I also don't have, something else has gnawed me awake, something worse, something Ben said during the interview. The border of Jammu and Kashmir and what? And it's a surprise, I said, not understanding the question, spurred by Lark's guidance to create mystery when one is confused. Now, down a rabbit hole of guessingly misspelled Google searches, I discover that I have a much, much bigger problem. Jammu and Kashmir are not two places, as Lark believes, but one place. 
Worse, she believes that those, those two separate places, uh, worse, she believes these two separate places to be at war with one another. And worst of all, she thinks that these two distinct war-torn civilizations are in the middle of the desert, a desert intended to be a perfect visual match for the clay she selected for the apotheotic 60-foot arc of the Kant Bodhisattva. All of this is my fault. I have been nodding so alacritously from the advent of Lark's vision to the momentum of its evolution that I have accidentally nodded at sand, at wilderness, at scribbles on maps, less cartographically sound than the new world as a volcanic swampland riddled with dragons. I've nodded us into a shared fiction, um, a non-existent border in a non-existent landscape patrolled by non-existent armed guards, lush with the mirage of artistic triumph. This nod, I realize now, is something I've picked up from Lark, the nod of attentive, partial understanding, of trust in one's own confidence above all, of willing one's own rightness into existence, of sorting it out later. Historically, Lark has chewed through assistance like gum. I've lasted the longest. This is evidence of strength I've always thought, although plastic outlives oak. Fake things always last the longest. I'll be fired, sued, maybe, she's done it before. I'll be ousted from the industry in LA, a cautionary tale about giving your assistant every advantage, flying her to India even, only to be so cruelly and incompetently betrayed. As I squelch back my gag reflex and study the map for any hope of a tenable lie, a figure appears on the adjacent balcony outside Lark's suite. It's Sai, wearing only a towel and a watch. He smiles, surprised but unashamed. Good morning, morning. Sai has brought a small tin with him onto the balcony. He cracks it open, retrieves a thin sheaf of rolling papers and a wad of tobacco. As he prepares to roll a cigarette, he appraises me with genuine sympathy. Heroin? Yeah, heroin. Sai sprinkles a bit of uh, tobacco and weed into the right-angled crease of a rolling paper. He licks and presses it into a cylinder, then offers it to me, leaning over the cusp of the balcony. It'll help with the hangover. Is that true? Sai shrugs. I lean out over the gap between the balconies, meeting him halfway so he can light the cigarette. Something else, yeah? Worse than heroin? I have no reason to trust Sai. He is a half stranger in a persimmon colored towel on my employer's balcony. Nonetheless, I've made a massive mistake, Sai. I tell Sai everything. He nods with the quiet, seasoned calm of a detective who's just learned the truth, neither predicted nor far-fetched. He lights a second cigarette, and when his phone rings, he answers it with one hand, smoking with the other. The conversation in crisp Hindi is liltingly familiar, curt. More H, I ask when he hangs up. He sets the phone on the small table beside his cigarette kit. Don't call it H, makes you sound like a tourist. Lark calls it H. Sai waves his cigarette in a gesture that says, well, there you have it. And no, that was my boyfriend. Oh. There's no graceful way to convey my curiosity or delight, or there is, and I'm too hungover to achieve it. So I say, I didn't know you were bi or pan or whatever. I didn't know you had a boyfriend. It's the overloud tone of perplexed support I remember from my own youth, from parishioners who thought themselves hip, and I wince. I'm gay. So I grins and smokes, pumping the cigarette between his lips as though he's filleting it, and also so that I can see the face of his new watch, a Chanel J12 with a quilted blue band. So Lark. Sai shrugs, which part of you is sacred? We smoke in silence, watching as more shadows move through doorways across the courtyard. I feel a surge of envy at Sai's ease. Still, don't get too excited. About what? About that watch. Her Chanel gifts are never real. Sai rolls a pair of cigarettes, then tucks them between both his lips and lights them at once. He hands one across the rift between the balconies. <clears throat> I'll help you, he says. We can drive out to Hickam through the Spitty Valley. There's a route where the signs are all in Devanar <laughs> Devanagari. She won't know the difference. I nearly ask him why he's helping, but he seems to sense this already. People like you and me, he says, we have to stick together for as long as it takes. How long is that? Until we're then. The following days are a slur of color and sound, the gumdrop stained glass of Asasar Mahal, sunken gray riverbanks of the Yamuna River, swollen with hyacinth, beneath everything, the tremulous lilt of Rashi's sitar. 
It's difficult in these days to say what is and is not the real India. The raucous commerce of the Moshpura Bazaar is the real India. The post-colonial wainscoting of the Sherlsgar Fort is not the real India. Camels are the real India. Camel jerky sold at the entrance of the Moshpura Bazaar is not the real India. At night, Sai and I drink ourselves into a state of ego, guessing, always under-guessing, how often the bartender, who looks nothing like Dev Patel, will be likened to Dev Patel by a revolving contingent of white female tourists. As the connective tissue of the operation, Sai has arranged with Varish to transport the statue to the coordinates we've selected near Hicken. Varish, who's grown weary of Lark's impatient, over-enunciated demand for the shape of the knees to create more feeling, is more than on board. None of the eight drivers cares, and all are loyal to Varish. We, meanwhile, are wending our way along a slightly more tortuous route to the, to the west, a careful itinerary with a semblance of spontaneity, ancient temples and markets, pit stops for chai, half built from Lark's memories, honed by Yelp reviews. The route is partly intended to disorient Lark, but Sai is right. Between the sex and the inscrutable signage, Lark has no idea where we are. By the time we arrive at what she believes to be the border between Jammu and Kashmir, the hired crew will already have unloaded the interlocking parts of the Kant Bodhisattva and pieced them together in a spectacular 60-foot arch she envisioned. Photos will be snapped, a short video will be made, and Lark, clad in the white linen Fendi Mousseline dress she's brought specifically for the occasion, will bow in the sand and worship the idol of her own creation. Of course, this is not exactly how it goes. North of Kaza, in the skittish half-quiet hours before sunrise, we barrel east along the jagged lightning bolt of an unnamed road. Sai drives with both hands on the wheel, more focused than I've ever seen him. Lark bounces in the passenger seat, a vintage Leica slung around her neck, raring to capitalize on the magic hour. Rishi, who has tried to make conversation once or twice over the past week, has apparently accepted that this is not the role in which Lark has cast him and now plays a persistent, hypnotic melody which quavers grimly every time we hit a dip in the road. I sit beside him in the back, dodging the neck of the sitar, watching each crest and hairpin turn the way one might wait for a tornado to finally touch ground. My only job on this leg of the journey is to distract Lark with conversation as we near the Dar Lung Wu statue point, the one landmark she might try to Google when this is all over. At last, the ruddy slopes on either side of the road give way to an expanse of cold desert, freckled with grass, gapingly empty beneath the sky. Threads of pink have just begun to claw up from the horizon like blood in a pool, casting a reddish glow against a massive, sinewy form towering six stories high. The Kant Bodhisattva in all her glory. Lark leaps from the car, giddy with her own magnificence. She runs toward the statue, beckoning me to record her running toward the statue. Through the lens of the small camera we've brought, she looks like a ghost, her dress and skin both nearly translucent. She races beneath the arched back of the statue, then mimics its pose like a tourist. Sai gets out of the car and stretches, flashing a thumbs up toward Lark. He checks the face of his knockoff Chanel watch, then angles it in my direction. 518. He winks. We've done it. Rishi hangs back, plucks a few final notes, then stops. The valley is silent. Where are the guards, Lark calls. Further east, I shout back. This section of the border is clear. Lark nods. She looks around like someone who has loudly declared for months that she doesn't want a surprise party, who is now disappointed that there isn't one. When she jogs back toward the car, I realize for the first time that she's barefoot. There's a pair of sandals in the go kit, but she refuses. They won't look right in the photos. In 10 minutes, her feet will be bleeding all over the place, but that's fine. It'll become part of the art somehow. As the sun rises, each detail of the statue emerges with the drama of a freshly discovered ruin. The crew Lark hired finished their work during the night just a few hours ago, but it looks as though it's been here for aeons, the nth wonder of the world. Sai pops the trunk and extracts four flutes and a bottle of O2 Perignon. I once made the error of not properly observing some gorilla exhibit, a wheat pasting fiasco in Portland, and have always budgeted for this moment since. The cork is popped, the glasses are poured. Lark untangles the strap of the Leica from her hair and snaps photos from every angle, the perfect curvature of the bodhisattva's toes, the soft gaze of her barely open eyes, the meticulous rift of the ass and the V-like crease of the thighs like a strap on either side, the subtly sculpted rings of the throat. Lark stares down the neck of the viewfinder, then smiles. She makes her way back to the car where she leads us all, even Rishi, in a sloppily joyful, sleep-deprived toast. As the sun continues to rise, tipping now from the magic hour to something less magical, a new revelation unfolds. The clay, which in this light has the look of gold covered in dust, has begun to crack. 
Varish has coated it in something, a sealant or epoxy of some kind, and when the sun hits it, the sheen of plasticky gloss begins to melt, slurring over the details of the statue. The cuticles of the toes dissolve, flattening the bodhisattva's feet into what look like beveled fins. The same phenomenon takes her fingers, above which the beaded rings of carved jewelry have begun to drip down the vertical spires of her wrist and forearms. It's impossible to see from this angle, but I imagine the fragile comma of her belly button caving in a widening, hollowing swell, like a meteor impact in slow motion. The curve of her upper lip, closer to the earth on account of her backward bend, painstakingly etched by some anonymous art student to convey a Mona Lisa smirk by way of Ishtar, dips and leaks toward the nostrils of her aquiline nose, which itself has drawn a seam between the molten divots of her eyes. Her tits by now are nebulous slumps, shifting the way patches of lava might, though not at the same rate, the perk of one nipple treading water while the other vanishes toward a dislocated clavicle. At the same latitude but the opposite side of the statue, the clitoris, lest we forget the size of a basketball, has slipped from beneath its protective hood toward the underwhelming dip of the anus. Each labium has merged with the other labia. The majora minora hierarchy has been fully dissolved. The focal cunt of eponymic primacy has slid into a glut of malformed clay and grainy silicon. Lark's gaze, white hot with adrenaline, already pulses with what will be a spectacular lawsuit, despite the fact that, as far as she knows, we're committing an act of vandalism on contested land. It's the wrong clay, she says simply, each syllable a bullet of self-righteousness. It's the clay you chose, I say, and the minute it's out of my mouth, I know I'll be fired, worse than fired. I'll fall within the concentric cancer of whatever legal action she devises. I'll be one of those trees that rips at the root before the local news has even announced a storm warning. When the first of the legs snaps, the other pieces crumple in surprising sequence, half cracked, half resilient, tethered together with the inelegance of Yoki meringue. Here and there, the epoxy clings to a tendril of wire like a sack of skin in which all the bones have been broken. Someone, somewhere along the way, fucked up. And this error became the foundation for another error, then another, and another. In the end, there will only be the wires left, stalwart and mortified as the masonry left after a nuclear test. A suggestion of something else, the city built for the purpose of being destroyed. Lark won't have to fire you. You'll agree on it together. You'll call the airline one last time before she changes the numbers to move up your flight. You'll meet other larks. There will be Sylvie, then Ava J, then Bronwyn. Each will take something from you and leave something else in its place. With each apple will come a bit more knowledge of your nakedness, a bit more comfort with leaving the garden. You'll start to meet her everywhere, but mostly she'll live in the voice you hear come out of your mouth sometimes when you're tired and a server leaves your water glass empty, or when a valet doesn't reset your seats to their original position. You'll be free, but there will always be a shred of you in the timbre of tight skin and good cars, the tone of voice that sounds like money. You'll be all right, better than all right, but it'll be like a virus, treated but not gone. When Sai's car is stopped at a checkpoint, Lark's not a monster, he's driving you all back to Delhi, underscored by Rishi's increasingly reluctant score. A guard asks your purpose for visiting India. Just to see it, I say. The guard sweeps both arms outward, boredly grandiose, as if to say, here it is. It's only land, as it's always been, ambivalent dirt, rocks that have no idea where they are. Lark is exhausted by the checkpoint, but pleased by the advent of Wi-Fi, scouring apps, scouting the next big thing. Because I'm free and sad and unmoored and have always wondered, and the stakes are low, I ask. Is this the real India? From the front seat, although it will certainly cost him dearly, Sai laughs. Then the guard laughs. And although Rishi does not laugh, he stops playing. And together, they cannot stop laughing. I uh, appreciate your listening and patience. Um, I don't want to go too long. I'm excited to get to our next act with EB. <laughs> um, I would love, I would love to hear and answer any questions you have. But I'm also very, very happy to um, save them for for discussion later. So um, yeah, thank you, thank you so much for letting me try this out on you. <laughs> <laughs>